Hi everyone, my name is Gabriel and this is the Hour of the Raven, your channel for everything Ravenloft, RPG, Dungeons and Dragons and Horror. Today we are going to study the history of Rishmuro, a past hidden beneath an unfathomable layers of secrets that challenges historians and arcanists. Before we start, I would like to remind everyone that this video will focus on Rishmuro from the classic Ravenloft setting and will consider the events and characters that existed in the domain before the reboot of the Von Richten Guide to Ravenloft. At the end of my video coverage of Rishmuro from the classic Ravenloft setting, I will make some considerations and comparisons with the new Rishmuro version from the Von Richten Guide to Ravenloft. Are you ready? In search of a cure of our condition of lycanthropy, we search for the whereabouts of the wizard Aurek Nuikin in the capital, Pon Amuzur, our investigation revealed that he and his younger brother Dimitri lived in the city in the past, in a decaying manner. We search for rumors about his activities, but what little we have learned is that he was exploring ancient ruins, searching for arcane secrets from Rishmuro's hidden past. Taking the courage to explore its ancient ruins, abandoned mansions, and underground tunnels, we begin to unveil the ancient past of this realm. Power of Raven. Those who seek to unravel Rishmuro's past find before them an unfathomable mystery, which offers researchers few answers and troubling questions. The domain of Rishmuro emerged from the mist in 694 of the Barovian calendar, but its early explorers found its vast cities and idyllic fields empty and abandoned. The grand and beautiful architectural works of its cities stood firm to they show its signs of neglect and the passage of time, but no sign of its builders and native population could be found. A few individuals who claimed to be native of these lands seemed to suffer from a strange amnesia and forget events prior to 694, and many see their claims as false allegations. Not even historical records and books recounting the past of these lands can be found in their abandoned structures, although many archivists, wizards and scholars of the occult have burrowed into its ruins and vast networks of underground tunnels in search of knowledge and lost secrets. Who were the original inhabitants of these lands, and where have they gone? What led them to abandon their cities and fields? leaving behind fertile lands and impressive architectural works? Had they fled from war, pestilence, or a supernatural threat? When historical research leaves us with no answers, and archaeologists cannot bring more than mere speculation about the past of these lands, religious clerics and practitioners of the occult arts try to use their gifts to unveil the shroud of mystery. However, not even the supernatural arts can reveal the past of this domain. Diviners, oracles, and mystics of the most varied arts cannot scrutinize the past beyond the year of 694. Even necromancers and mediums, willing to raise the dead in the ancient cemeteries or contact ancestral spirits, cannot get an answer as the dead and ghosts although responsive, remain in a disturbing silence about the past of those lands before its unveiling to the beasts. Some scholars of the occult claim that the entire land of Rishmuro may have been swallowed up by the mists for a ruined world, or even the dark entities that control the demiplane of drag created these lands from the matter of mists to achieve some dark purpose. The secret surrounding Rishmuro past and the fate of its former inhabitants could be a mystery capable of driving away possible settlers, but the existence of fertile lands and buildings free to be claimed attracted explorers and settlers to that region, 
after its unveiling to the beast. Rich Mulo, for many, was and is the land of the present and the future. No matter what is the truth hidden in its mysterious and unfathomable past. Lured by a chance to gain land, influence and power, several aristocratic and entrepreneurial families migrated to Richmulo, using their resources, guards and influence to take possession of that empty territory. This occupation and dispute for Richmulo led to countless conflicts between these important families Many believed at the time of their unveiling by the mists that the absence of a central authority, laws, or common customs would turn this region into an open battlefield filled with rebellions and conflicts. No chaos, conflict, and disorder occurred, however, as one of these families quickly rose to power and took the reins and control of this new region. The powerful and dominant Honier family established themselves from the beginning as central figures of authority, although not supported by any religious, traditional or legal basis. The family patriarch, Claude Ronier, became a de facto monarch in everything but a formal title. Claude was a cunning and cruel man, and he established his dominance in Richemulo through a complex game of diplomacy, espionage, and above all, threats. Many were the families who tried to dispute their influence and power in Richmond, only to find themselves blackmailed by the Ronniers, having their secret exposed, or meeting a treacherous and violent end in the dead of night, when they failed to demonstrate the wisdom of retreating in the face of Claude's threats. Careful observers, they realize that generally the past of a kingdom engulfed by the mists is intimately linked to the crimes and tragedy of its rulers. If the past of these lands remains too deep a mystery to be revealed, we may be luckier trying to unravel the past of the mighty Ronier clan. The Ronier family has its origins in an unknown world of the material plane, the same place that in the past House of the lands that are now part of the modern domain. The Ronier family acquired fortune in the distant past through the figure of an explorer and adventurer named Jacques Ronier, who gained prestige and titles by providing services to the royal family. Thanks to his remarkable achievements and service to the crown, the Ronniers rose socially, and Jacques Ronier was rewarded with the government of the distant province of Mordent, where he moved with his family. Jacques Ronier took control of those remote lands and began the grandiose process of expansion and colonization of that region. He also started, in Mordentshire, the construction of his family mansion, the imposing House of the Griffon Hill. Something evil had stalked that building from the beginning and strange and macabre accidents occurred throughout the construction. Despite these setbacks, the construction was completed, and the Ronier family moved in the imposing manner. A few weeks later, however, the entire family fled in the middle of the night, claiming to have been attacked by supernatural forces and never returned to the house. No one knows how or why this happened, but corruption has crept into Ronier blood ever since. Of the six children that Jacques Ronier had with his wife, five of them were natural born like crows, being were rats. Some claim that Jacques Ronier's past adventures have taken its toll. Other claims that this corruption is the result of the contact with the evil forces of the house of the Griffon Hill, and others claimed that this blemish has always been present in one of the family branches, and it was only previously contained by mystical protections. When these children grew up, and the signs of the cursed condition began to manifest, the Ronias fell in disgrace. Family members who were lycanthropes were hunted down, and had to flee the lands of Mordent, and those who were not infected with lycanthropy lost their prestige and power. This schism 
generated great resentment on the part of the Ronier lycanthropes, a hatred that would not be easily forgotten. When the region of Mordant was engulfed in the mists, some of the Roniers, who were still human, were brought into the demiplane of Dread. The branch of the family that had become natural lycanthropes remained in their homeworld, and after centuries of persecution, the young Claude Ronier became the patriarch and leader of this family of rare rats, controlling his family with an iron fist and fueling dreams of power and revenge. Cut off from the nobility and prestige of their ancestors, they learned to live between two worlds, hiding their monstrous nature with wit, cunning and manipulation. These precautions were not enough to ensure their safety, and when the clan was discovered again, they were once more hunted down and murdered. Cornered, they had to resort to extreme measures to survive, and Claude led them to enter a mystical portal to escape their pursuers. Cruel fate brought this branch of the family into the land of the mist as well, and they emerged in the city of Silbervas in Falkovnia. The ambitious and ruthless Claude Ronier saw in those unknown lands a chance to fulfill his dreams of power, and quickly took control of a thief's guild while spreading the lycanthropy infection throughout the city. Claude Ronier was known as the Claude, and his presence posed a threat to the absolute ruler of those lands, the infamous Lord Vlad Drakov. His attempt to rise to power did not go unnoticed by the military who commanded the realm. And when one of the elite soldiers was beaten and infected with lycanthropy, Vlad Rakov personally led the campaign to purge Falkovnia from rare rats. For three years, feast battles raged in the underground and sewers of Silberhus. And this period was recorded in Falkovnian history as the years of the impaled rats. All of Claude's cunning, cruelty and brilliance was not enough to stop the enemy soldiers' advances, and faced with another imminent defeat and extermination, Claude Ronier led his family's flight into the misty frontier. Historical records seem to approximate the dates of this desperate escape and the availing by the mists of the lands of Rich Perhaps these lands are also part of the lost world from which the Ronier emerged, or maybe were created to house their true masters, the rats and were rats, who suffered the cursed Ronier. Cloud Ronier and his rare rat clan emerged in the empty and uninhabited kingdom of Rishmo and took advantage of the structure of its abandoned cities to establish itself as leader of that region. The Ronieres became aristocrats of that realm, which soon attracted immigrants and explorers from various parts of the core. Although there is no established monarchy, Claude Ronier established his power and government in the region with a mixture of intrigue, manipulation and fear. Under Claude Ronier's command, Lishmur has grown to become an increasingly thriving region that is attractive to immigrants. The once uninhabited land became a new chance for those who wanted a fresh start and a refuge for those fleeing the many horrors of the lands of the mists. The Ronias were also accused of providing shelter to criminal groups, fugitives, murderers, heretics, and practitioners of dark arts. The population who inhabited this land often also have their own secrets to protect. Rod never forgot his defeat against the tyrant Drakov, who hunted him down and expelled him from Silberverse. He always knew that the day would come when his bellicose neighbor to the north would send his troop to conquer his thriving kingdom and hunt down his family once and for all. As Claude Ronier expected, Drakov launched a military campaign against Rishmulo in the year 716. Claude, however, was one step ahead of Vlad Drakov, 
and for years he had prepared his defense and revenge, and the invasion by Falkovnia was repelled. Vlad Rakov also did not forget old enmities and never tired of coveting new military conquests. In 724, Vlad Rakov started the executioner campaign, launching a strong simultaneous onslaught against Bemondu and Richemulo, but was once again overcome by the cunning and preparation of Claude Ronier, who impeded his advances. The cunning and ruthless leader prevented external advances on Richemulo, but he also had to deal with internal threats. His domination over the realm was due to a complex game of intrigues and threats, and he was always seeking to manipulate and discover secrets of the rival aristocrat families. The Ronier family grew in number and power, and became important members of Richemuro society and aristocracy. Claude knew that his own kin would pose a threat to his power, and he was both a mentor and a tormentor to them. With his cunning and manipulation, he kept his relatives in constant strife and conflict, and he secured by force and influence his position as a leader. For 30 years, his strategy worked, and he remained the undisputed leader of Richemulo and the Ronier clan. Lord Ronier would meet his end in the year 726 of the Barovian calendar, under unclear circumstances. He fell from a window on the top floor of his mansion, Chateau de la Nuit, crashed through the roof of the property's canal, and was partially devoured by the family dogs. Rumor says that those who examined his body identified that his skin showed traces of a severe allergic reaction or poison. Some speculated the granddaughters of Claude Ronier, Jacqueline, and Louise Ronier as suspects of the crime, but few dare to share these accusations today. Claude Ronier's sudden and mysterious death left a power vacuum that was quickly filled by his granddaughter Jacqueline Ronier. Those hoping to usurp the Ronier position of power found in Jacqueline an opponent equally cruel and cunning. Through her power was exercised with more charisma and subtlety than her grandfather. She has ensured the Ronier's permanence as Richemulo's ruling family and has shown herself to be an apt leader. While Claude has secured his position through games of threat and fear, Jacqueline presents herself as a more thoughtful leader and has gradually gained the respect and admiration of the population, who call her La Grande Dame. Only fools are charmed by her apparent diplomacy and civility. The beautiful Jacqueline is her grandfather's best apprentice and does not shy away from threatening or retaliating against those who stand in her way. She always seems to be one step ahead of her rivals and often eliminates potential problems before they have a chance to threaten her dominance. In the year 729, Jacqueline led an important diplomatic agreement for Richemulo, having been a signatory of the Treaty of the Four Towers, an alliance of mutual protection signed by the leaders of the Molieu, Mordent, Richemulo, Orca, and Dorvinia. Since the signing of such agreement, Polkovnia has not started other military campaigns against the signatory nations. This period of relative peace, however, has not stopped other forces from trying to usurp control of Jacqueline over the years. In 743 of the Barovian calendar, a nobleman named Girard Cavaillon attempted to negotiate a secret agreement with Falkovnia to depose Jacqueline Ronier. No one knows for sure the details behind the scenes of this betrayal, but everything indicates that Jacqueline Ronier anticipated her rival and negotiated a secret agreement with Vlad Rakov, who received Girard Cavaillon, beautiful mistress, as a prisoner, as a gift and a gesture of good faith. Our searches for the whereabouts of the wizard Aurek Nuikin 
Lead us to explore abandoned mansions and ancient ruins, and unveil secrets of Rishmuro's bloody and mysterious past. Our quest seems to bring us closer and closer to the dangerous Ronier family, and the sinister rumors that surround this clan. As we search for clues in a damp basement in an abandoned villa of a fallen aristocratic family, we had a distinct feeling that we are being watched, and we notice countless rats surrounding us. The rodents approach us menacingly, and soon we are forced to flee the large number of pestilential creatures. We fled through ancient tunnels and alleys, not realizing that such creatures guided us to a certain destination. When we enter an abandoned house to protect ourselves, we are surprised to find a beautiful dark-haired lady inside the empty saloon. Her presence both fascinate and intimidate us, and she demands to know why we are researching the past of Rishmuro and her family. Fearing the cruelty that exudes from her gaze, we reveal that we are looking for our renowned wizard, Aurek Nuikin, to help us with the terrible curse. Aurek Nuikin's name seems to surprise our terrifying hostess, and she reflects for a moment. With a calm in her voice, she drops the threatening tone, and says that she would also like to know more about Aurek Nuikin's whereabouts, and that she would help us to find him. Without clarifying anything else, she leaves us alone in the abandoned hall, and says that we will soon have news of her. Rats that surround us are scattering everywhere, and we are alone in that desolate environment. Who is our mysterious hostess in this decadent abode? Was her the Grand Dame Jacqueline Ronier, or perhaps her twin sister Louise? Back in the safety of our quarters, we receive a sealed envelope containing information and secrets from possible locations of figures who might be harboring our Nuiki. Join us to subscribe to this channel and activate notifications, and together we will continue our quest for the elusive arcane as we unveil Rishmuro's darkest secrets.